Everyone thinks Megalodon was the meanest thing to ever cruise the oceans. The ultimate sea monster. The headline act. The, if it's big, it's probably Megalodon celebrity of prehistory. But um, what if I told you the real ruler of the ancient seas wasn't a shark at all? What if the true apex predator was something so brutally overbuilt that it could make Megalodon look like, well, an enthusiastic goldfish with confidence issues. So take a deep breath, because we're about to dive into the prehistoric deep and meet the predator that didn't just bite it, grabbed, held, and tore the ocean's giants apart. Now picture yourself sinking through cold blue layers into an ocean that doesn't exist anymore. The light fades, the water thickens into shadow. Somewhere, out there, a vast shape glides past like a moving building, silent, purposeful, and completely uninterested in your survival. In our modern imagination, that silhouette is always Megalodon. Megalodon is the star, basically the Hollywood blockbuster of paleontology. It's in movies, memes, clickbait thumbnails, and the occasional nightmare of anyone who's ever done an open water swim and remembered they have an imagination. Honestly, the internet treats Megalodon like a default setting. If something is large and aquatic, it gets upgraded to Megalodon. A chunky mackerel mini-meg, a suspicious shadow near a boat. Megalodon confirmed. But here's the thing in the fossil record. Being famous doesn't automatically make you the final boss. Sometimes the spotlight blinds us to what's lurking just outside the frame. And to be fair, Megalodon deserves the hype estimates, often put it around 15 to 18 meters long, depending on which reconstruction you trust and how conservative you want to be with those fossil clues. That's not a shark you spot, that's a shark you experience. Compared to a 1.7 meters human, it's like encountering a submerged bus that has decided your entire species looks snack-sized. Some reconstructions even suggest a head around 4.5 meters long, a tall dorsal fin, and a tail powerful enough to turn the ocean into a personal treadmill. Megalodon wasn't just big, it was engineered for predation, a streamlined body, a mouth built for slicing through thick flesh and teeth that looked like they were designed by someone who thought overkill was a warm-up. But legends have a way of flattening the details. Megalodon wasn't everywhere, and it wasn't unbeatable. Fossil evidence suggests it was strongly associated with warmer and temperate seas, and there's good reason to think it used coastal nursery areas, safer, shallower habitats, where young sharks could grow with a little less risk of becoming lunch for something even worse. Yes, even baby sea monsters need daycare, and hair's a fascinating twist. There's been serious scientific discussion about whether Megalodon and some large sharks may have had a kind of regional warm-bloodedness able to keep parts of their bodies warmer than the surrounding water, boosting power and endurance. If that's true, it helps explain the sheer athleticism of such a huge predator. But it comes with a price. High performance burns fuel. A predator like that doesn't just need food. It needs a stable, productive ocean that can keep feeding the engine. Think of Megalodon like a supercar, gorgeous, loud in spirit, even if not in sound, built to dominate the open road. But you don't take a supercar into a muddy field and expect it to be happy. When climates shift, ocean currents reorganize, and prey availability changes. Even the biggest hunter on the map has to adapt or fade. Over time, as seas cooled in some regions and marine ecosystems reshuffled competition at the top, likely intensified. Other large predators, like ancestors and relatives of modern great whites, may have overlapped in prey and hunting grounds, especially as resources tightened. In an ecosystem, the apex isn't a throne you inherit. It's a job interview that never ends, and the ocean has a ruthless HR department. And that brings us to the moment where we lower our voice a little, because this is where the story gets deliciously unsettling. Somewhere in the Miocene seas, roughly 12 to 8 million years ago, there swam a predator with a familiar outline. But the equipment was, ah, 
completely wrong in the best possible way. Meet Leviathan Melvilli, a giant predatory sperm whale named with a wink toward ancient sea monsters and Herman Melville's Moby Dick. This wasn't a gentle giant filtering krill or politely singing at the moon. This was a mammal built for violence, an apex hunter that could plausibly go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Megalodon in the same waters, and in some situations make the shark's whole top predator routine look a bit less guaranteed. Harris, why Megalodon was a specialist in cutting huge jaws, serrated teeth a bite, designed to slice through flesh and disable quickly. Liviatan was built to grab, and once it grabbed, it didn't let go politely. Fossils suggest it had massive teeth in both the upper and lower jaws, something modern sperm whales don't have for hunting big prey. Some of those teeth are estimated to exceed 30 centimeters in length, with terrifying thickness. These are not delicate instruments. They're structural. They're the kind of teeth you expect on an animal that plans to bite something large, muscular, and capable of fighting back. Its skull could reach around three meters long, and as a mammal, it likely had tremendous neck and body power to drive a bite wrench and tear more like a grappler than a slicer. If Megalodon is a set of razor blades, Liviatan is a hydraulic clamp. Both are nightmares. They just ruin your day in different fonts. And the differences don't stop at the mouth. Liviatan wasn't simply a big head with teeth. It belonged to a broader group of macroraptorial sperm whales, predators that hunted large marine animals during the Miocene. Fossils linked to this kind of lifestyle show up in multiple places suggesting these whales or close relatives weren't limited to a single tiny corner of the world. The star specimen comes from Peru's Pisco Formation, an extraordinary fossil region that preserves a whole ancient marine community like a snapshot of a lost ocean. But the wider guild of big-toothed sperm whales appears to have had a broader reach. In other words, this wasn't a one-off oddity. It was part of an era where the seas had multiple heavyweight predators sharing the same stage. Now do we have footage of Liviatan and Megalodon squaring off like some prehistoric pay-per-view event? Sadly, no, the Miocene didn't have drones. But we can still reason from anatomy and ecology. A giant shark tends to hunt with speed, ambush, and a devastating bite that causes catastrophic blood loss. A giant predatory whale could combine speed with sheer muscular control, lunging, clamping down, and using body weight and momentum to wrestle prey. That matters, because the ocean isn't just about who bites harder, it's also about who can control the fight. A shark can inflict horrifying damage, but a powerful, warm-blooded mammal with a massive skull and grappling teeth could potentially dominate certain encounters, especially if prey is large, mobile, and worth holding on to, rather than simply slashing and retreating. And then there's the ecosystem effect, the part that feels very BBC, because it's where you realize apex predators don't just eat things. Imagine coastal Peru today. Dry desert sun, bleached landscapes, and wind. Now rewind millions of years, and that same region becomes a thriving sea filled with whales, seals, fish, and predators stacked like layers in a living pyramid. The Pisco Formation preserves bones scattered like punctuation marks across time. Whale skeletons, shark teeth, marine birds, an open-air archive of ancient dramas, in ecosystems like that, a predator like Liviatan isn't merely a hunter, it's a signal. It changes where animals migrate, how they group together, and which species can afford to be bold. Sometimes, the most powerful creature in an environment isn't the one that kills the most, it's the one that decides when the entire ocean gets nervous. There's also evidence in many fossil marine communities that carcasses became temporary banquets attracting multiple scavengers and predators. A single dead whale can feed an army sharks arriving in waves, different species leaving different bite marks, a rolling sequence of guests at a grisly buffet. In a world with giant predators, those events may have been common, 
and the first attacker, often the true heavyweight, effectively sets the table for everyone else. So, even without imagining a dramatic Meg versus Liviatan duel, you can see how both could dominate Megalodon as the fast slicing executioner Liviatan, as the grappling bone crushing enforcer. Two apex strategies, same ocean, different rules, and eventually both kings vanish. Not because they suddenly got weak, but because the planet changed the game. Cooler climates, shifting currents, Altered coastlines and changing prey distributions can topple even the most terrifying predator. The top of the food web is a narrow ledge, one wobble in energy supply, and the whole structure shakes. Evolution doesn't do lifelong contracts. It does constant auditions. The Miocene's giants rose because the oceans could support them, and they disappeared when those oceans became something else. So the next time you hear King of the Sea pause and ask King of which sea and when, because beneath every legend is a fossil waiting to surprise you, and beneath every famous predator is another contender that history didn't bother turning into a movie yet. And now I've got to know, are you Team Megalodon the Living Blade, or Team Liviaton the prehistoric grappler with teeth like demolition tools? Drop your allegiance in the comments and let's keep this ocean-sized debate swimming.